2018 is here, and in museums across Portsmouth, there are new exhibits and shows coming up in January and February. We'll take a look at some of them right here on this episode of Museum Moments. Welcome to this January, February 2018 episode of Museum Moments, the show that's your window into what's happening right here in Museum City, Portsmouth. I'm your host, Rob Lauer. I'm standing here at Old Town at the corner of High Street and Court Street, and right next to me is a building that has long been a Portsmouth landmark. In the mid 20th century, it was built as the famous, a very upscale ladies apparel store. The famous closed in the 1980s, and several years later, this building was purchased by Tyler Community College. Thereafter, it became the home for all of the art classes offered by TCC. Those classes are offered upstairs in the floors above, but the main floor is the TCC Visual Arts Center Galleries, an art museum. It's open seven days a week from 8.30 in the morning until 8.30 in the evening, and it's only closed on Christmas, Thanksgiving, and New Year's. There are exhibits throughout the year in the galleries, so we're going to head inside and find out what's on store for this January and February. Come on. I'm joined by Ryan Muldowney, who is a faculty member here at TCC. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you. So tell us, what exactly is your title? What's your position here? Yeah, I'm an assistant professor of studio art here in the studio art program at uh, the Visual Arts Center. Right? Yeah. And right now we have going on, as we film this, this is the annual faculty show. And right. this is art that's done by faculty members. That's, that's correct. Faculty and sort of emeritus faculty. So we've got a sort of mix of current adjunct and full-time faculty members, as well as folks that have worked in the department in the past are also invited to exhibit their work. With Great. Them. And I don't understand that this is some of your work. This is that. some. Uh, emphasis on some. I do a lot of different things. <laughs> Among them, uh, oil painting is one of the sort of keystones sort of or cornerstone pieces of my studio practice. So. Like, is it, these are oils? Yeah, these are oil paintings um, uh, from a series uh, that I was working on having to do with um, a sort of a mimicry of the creation, sort of uh, building for myself, uh, you know, birds and beasts and fishes and so on and so forth. So uh, we only have some of them here, mainly just birds and beasts. But, uh, <laughs> but there's a larger body of work associated with, with this about the, uh, the creation. So. Now we have coming up in uh, February, I believe January, February, the next show. Correct. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's coming up here. Okay, so it's kind of an interesting uh, exhibition opportunity uh, for me specifically. Um, my dad is a painter. Um, and uh, my father had 12 children, and a number of us went into uh, art as a, as a career path. And uh, a number of us also studied at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia, first art school in America. And so we had this kind of interesting experience of being sort of raised by my father in his studio, being taught by him how to paint, draw, and things like that. Uh, and also sharing the same sort of formal education at the Pennsylvania Academy. Um, and so we thought it'd be an interesting show. The show's called The Generations Influences of the Pennsylvania Academy. Um, the idea behind the show is to kind of weigh this notion of nature versus nurture that sort of exists within our own kind of family artistic dynamic. Clearly we all have the same sort of um, uh, point of extraction, meaning we, we, we were in this family together with same influences and ideas kind of kicking around. And we were trained in a place that had very sort of uh, specific ideas about what art making should emphasize or be about. Um, and yet, th what's interesting is that the work of everyone in the family is kind of different. Uh, and so it's this interesting examination, we thought, of how coming from a similar point of origin, there's kind of a lot of trajectories into different areas of artistic exploration. So what are the types of things we'll see then? Okay, so my dad is sort of very traditional painter. Um, you know, when we were growing up in his studio, he was always very enamored with the old masters um, and uh, their painting techniques. Um, so his work, uh, I think, references more a traditional um, uh, style and approach uh, to oil painting largely, but he also does uh, printmaking. Uh, you know, one of the family art gods, I guess, is, is Rembrandt, who kind of had a uh, 
clearly one of the greatest painters of all time, but at the same time, one of the greatest printmakers of all time. So he sort of was able to be, you know, a master of a number of different mediums. So my, my, my dad's very much interested in these sort of um, traditional, often influenced by sort of Baroque painting techniques, uh, imagery uh, that tie into sort of personal spiritual narratives. And a lot of them are sort of very subtle because they appear to be landscapes, uh, and yet there's, there's kind of uh, subtext, these sort of influences into the imagery. My sister, uh, Shoshana uh, Muldowney Rucker, she um, is interested in sort of the passage of time, particularly in urban areas, and how sort of deteriorating structures are sort of markers to the passage of time. And while we often look at, you know, abandoned buildings and broken bridges and things like that as, uh, uh, you know, I guess, these ugly and sort of uh, not very nice things to look at within a, a metropolitan area, she sees them as these sort of uh, lovely, unlovely, you know, uh, marker of the passage of time. So she has a lot of these sort of urban uh, prints, drawings, and, and oil paintings, um, most of them small scale. Um, now my brother and I, Jacob, uh, Jacob teaches down at Chuan University uh, in North Carolina, we're kind of a little bit different because uh, my father and my sister sort of, they kind of plumb one direction ideologically in their work and my brother and I are sort of a little bit more multidisciplinary. We do a lot of different things. We're interested and influenced by a lot of different things and we take a lot of different paths. One thing that's often said in artistic circle is that, you know, some artists are like hedgehogs and some artists are like foxes and the hedgehog just kind of burrows deeper and deeper and the fox sort of hops from hole to hole. All right, um, so me and foxes. Yeah, well, so my brother and I are kind of a little bit more foxes, and uh, my sister and my dad are a little bit more of the hedgehog variety. They kind of have a, a kind of a direction that they keep uh, mining away, and my brother and I kind of are hopping into a bunch of different holes. So I do, my brother and I both do digital. We do painting, we do printmaking, we do drawing, we do sort of. Um, you know, uh, art objects, we do uh, um, a bunch of different things. Uh, so whatever takes our fancy. Uh, so a lot of times it, make, it means for a really wide and somewhat incongruous body of work. But that's, I think, one of the things that's interesting about the show is that you, you have the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts is very traditional in its approach to teaching art. And yet, you know, we have a lot of different contemporary sort of new media and uh, contemporary approaches that are fairly non-traditional that appear in the show side by side with traditional work. But that sounds really interesting. And, and uh, this again opens in late January. Correct, January 20th and the show runs uh, March 7th. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, it sounds fascinating. I will be back to see that. Well, good. Thanks so much for coming in and sharing your art with us. I appreciate it. All right, thanks, yeah, Ryan. Not at all. When we return to Museum Moments, we'll have a look at what's taking place at the Children's Museum of Virginia and the Portsmouth Alton Cultural Center. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. You're watching PCTV, television for the new Portsmouth. Portsmouth on the right side of the river. Rediscover your neighbor, the new Portsmouth. 
Welcome back to our January, February 2018 episode of Muse and Moments. We're filming today inside the TCC Visual Arts Center. Now, right across the street from the Visual Arts Center is the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center, which is owned by the city. It's housed in the old 1846 courthouse. They have exhibits going on throughout the year. And here's someone who can tell us what's coming up in January and February. I'm joined by Stephen Grunick from the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much, Rob. I really appreciate you having me back, We're especially in this lovely gallery. Isn't it beautiful? TCC. Yeah. I yeah. love this place. I know. And you are right You are right across the street at right the Art and Cultural the Center. Yeah. So, and this, they're open seven days a week, so basically you can hit both galleries. We, exactly. If you come to see... When someone, when someone comes to see us, we send them across the street to see um, the art shows here at Tide, Tidewater Community College Visual Arts Center. Um, a lot of the artists um, in the exhibit right now, the faculty show, are local mm -hmm. artists. And that's something we're going to feature pretty soon in the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center. We're going to have a show called Portsmouth Here and Now, mm -hmm. and it's going to feature local artists who live or work in Portsmouth, who live in and or work in Portsmouth, something like that. <laughs> they have a Portsmouth connection. Exactly. <laughs> so um, a lot of them are faculty here at the Visual Arts Center and teach in the public schools for the city of Portsmouth. So it's going to be a wide range of different styles and media from jewelry to sculpture, photography, and all of them showcase the local talent here in the community. We're also going to have a show um, on the second floor called In Print, which will feature printmaking artists, and many of those will be local too. So the, um, the shows will all open uh, the end of February, beginning of March. The reception, the public reception, will be March 2nd. And this will kick off our first weekend series when we always have free admission, the first Friday of the month, that'll be March 2nd, will be the first one, and free music. Um, Ports, the Portsmouth Partnership uh, sponsors these events that um, are of fantastic value to the community, so yeah. there's no charge for people to come every first Friday of the month from March through October and see our exhibits. It's a great, it's a great way to spend a Friday night. Exactly, yeah. And then the next day, too, we have a first Saturday event that follows that same um, First Friday series. Now, this show of Portsmouth artists, or artists that are connected with Portsmouth, you have the grand opening that first weekend in March. Is this, Does the show itself open that night, or is it open at all in February? Um, there will be an opening in February, but it's not a reception. Okay. On the 28th of February, the um, show will open and then, but both in print and ports of here and now will be open on March 2nd. Now, you're an artist yourself, aren't you? Uh, passively. So will you have anything in the exhibit? I will not. That is a conflict of interest. <laughs> but I do have stuff for sale in our gift shop, Rob. Okay, so all right. <laughs> you can uh, take a look there and purchase some of my paintings in our local gift shop. And our local gift shop is also a destination. The Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center Gallery Shop mm -hmm. is run by Lyona Bourgeau, who is an excellent um, uh, manager and she features local artists, handmade crafts, and much of it is and very- And even those days when the Art and Cultural Center is closed because maybe between exhibits where you're taking down one exhibit and putting up the other, is the, the gift shop still open on those days? Yes, exactly. So that's pretty much, that. those are set hours throughout the year, every week of the year. Yeah, gotcha. that gift shop is a destination. And they have beautiful pieces in there, really unique things, like you said, that are made by local artists and craftsmen. Right. We are going to be having some uh, seasonal programs every spring in February. We have a Valentine's Day chocolate dipping activity. And this features Marianne Boho of the Williamsburg Chocolatier. She's done this for years. She started um, years ago. The first year she did it, her mom had passed away. And her mom was the one who headed up this business of the chocolate making and Marianne goes and does parties and special events, and so she always does a Valentine's Day chocolate dipping the Saturday before Valentine's Day in February. Um, some of the continuing programs we're gonna have um, are, we do in-house with one of our 
staff, Leslie Wren, who is an art educator, and she worked for us uh, a couple years ago and then um, started working again in, on the education team. So she does something every Friday morning at 10.30 called Storytime Art. Mm -hmm. And she'll read a story to, uh, these, are, these are programs for um, preschoolers. preschoolers, yeah. And uh, families can come and bring their preschoolers and they'll listen to a story read by Leslie and maybe do some dancing or movement activities and then do an art project based on that story. So there's a number of different um, uh, activities they do within that program that really um, is exciting and enjoyable and educational for the kids and their parents. So during the month of January this is going on still? Yeah, we'll probably start those programs in January and um, of course it's free for members. The exhibits won't be up, but we still have these programs going on in the art annex behind our gift shop. Great, fantastic. Yeah. Anything else or is, does that pretty much cover it for these I two months? I think that's all I can remember at this point, Rob. Oh. But thank you for answering. Well, thanks for coming in and taxing your memory and telling us about those. Thank you, I really appreciate it. And be sure to visit the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center. It's located in the old 1846 courthouse on the corner of High Street and Court Street, just across the street from the TCC Visual Arts Center. Just down the street from the TCC Visual Arts Center and the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center is the Children's Museum of Virginia. Here's someone to tell us what they have coming up during the months of January and February. I'm joined by Corey Staden, who is an educator with the Children's Museum of Virginia. Welcome, Corey. Thank you, Ralph, for having me again. Oh, good to have you back. So tell us, what's coming up in January and February at the Children's Museum of Virginia? Well, there are lots of good things happening at the museum and systems in general in January. And of course, we roll right out of our, roll right out of our Winter Wonderland series into our African American Heritage Month series. And that starts on the Saturday, January 13th, just before Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Monday, with a special concert by Mr. Eric Taylor. He's a very, very wonderful violinist who's gonna take us on a journey through African-American music from, uh, the, from spirituals to blues, jazz, gospel, and even hip hop on his violin with a special focus on the uh, music, musical John eras, the musical eras between the 1940s and 1960s when the Portsmouth Community Library Museum was functioning. Following that, we have an exciting dance troupe that's coming all the way from Danville, Virginia called Kuwumba African dance. They're going to go be at the Children's Museum on that Saturday, January the 20th. They'll be doing African dance and drumming right there on the open space of the Children's Museum. And then they'll be going over to John Tyler Elementary as a library presentation for the Portsmouth Public Libraries. We have, uh, we have different uh, events at the Portsmouth Community Library Museum again. We're looking to have Mr. Uh, Ken Wright to come and do some things with his Buffalo Soldiers presentation. We have the Hurrah players coming on February 3rd to the Children's Museum to actually present a several vignettes from the upcoming production called Safari Tales of the Grio, which is great for those teachers that are teaching Molly as part of the SOL, uh, SOL curriculum. We have, uh, there's a presentation by the Not Just for February players at Emanuel AME Church that's part of our uh, library uh, museum series. And we also are going to have a special tribute on the 24th of Jan February. February, February 24th, they're going to be, it's going to be a special tribute to African Americans who have served in the military throughout history, featuring Mr. Marvin Greer as a living history ex, uh, presentation of uh, James Armistead Lafayette, uh, who helped the secure the Yorktown victory as a spy during the Revolutionary War. We'll have the uh, first color troop of New Bern representing the first African American infantry out of New Bern, North Carolina to participate in the Civil War. And then we have um, Tuskegee Airmen, Vietnam pilots, and we have uh, some of the more modern era wars from the Gulf War to the wars in Iraq. We have Ms. Taniki Richards and her husband. They'll, they'll be coming to present memorabilia and artifacts that they collected doing their two military tours overseas in the Middle East. So a lot of fun and exciting and interesting things. A happen. lot of things going on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We try to keep it in, we try to keep it dynamic in the Portsmouth Museum. Children's Museum, what are the hours in January and February? What days and hours are they open? Well after the holiday season is over, we'll be going back to our standard uh, operation hours, which are Tuesday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. 
Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and then Sundays from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Now the community library is the museum. Is that open all the time? Is that set hours or are those just for, is it open just for special events and educational events? The Portsmouth Community Library Museum is uh, normally open by appointments, but there for this particular series it'll be open for special events on Saturdays. Uh, thank you so much for stopping in and telling us all about it. Uh, thank you. Get the citizens of Portsmouth. Come on out and join us. We're glad to have you part of, as part of our celebration. When we return to Muse in Moments, we'll meet with Diane Cripps for another hands-on history segment. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. Watching PC TV, television for the new Portsmouth. Portsmouth on the right side of the river. Rediscover your neighbor, the new Portman. Welcome back to this January, February 2018 episode of Museum Moments. We're filming today inside the beautiful TCC Visual Arts Center here in Old Town Portsmouth at the corner of Port Street and High Street. Now, there are several holidays in February. One of them is President's Day. And to celebrate President's Day, we thought we would like to show you something presidential. So we contacted Diane Cripps, the curator of the Shipyard Museum, and she is here for another episode of Hands-On History. Diane, welcome back to Muse and Moments. Thanks, Rob. So, you have something here that it can sort of be related to President's Day, I understand. That's right. You know, as a museum curator, we often have to figure things out. We have to look at artifacts, and they may not tell us their whole story. We might have to look for a maker's mark or try to figure out what style it is and when it was made. But other times, artifacts tell us their own story, and we like those best because they're easy to figure out. And so that's what I brought today. You know, our museum's been closed for a long time with renovations and repairs, and we haven't had a chance to bring out some of our artifacts that are in storage that we've had for a very long time. Uh, and so what I brought today are, uh, is a collection of naval commissioning certificates. And that means that when officers were commissioned into the Navy, they received a document, and it's usually signed by somebody very important, either the Secretary of the Navy, Acting Secretary of the Navy in some cases, or in most cases, the President of the United States. So that's wow. what I brought today. We're gonna journey back in time. We're gonna make a few stops in the 19th century, in the 20th century, and even dip back into the 18th century, and just look at a few moments in some uh, naval officers' lives that I'm sure were very significant to them and when we open our museum drawers today and meet some of these people historically, we just kind of take a breath and stop. <laughs> so um, I, I have a couple here that are just uh, individual certificates that I, I want to start with. This one is from 1876. It's for a gentleman named John Bailey and this commissioned him as a sailmaker, which is something you don't hear about anymore today, but he was commissioned and it's actually signed by Ulysses S. Grant. Um, <laughs> Wow. Some of these are a little hard to read, but if you read the date and you look at what you realize what you're looking at, you say, that's who that is. Um, and like I said, it's just a phenomenal moment when we open the drawer and we see something like that. So here in 1876, we have President Grant. And then here's another one that looks a little different. This one's a little easier to figure out because it has its, his name right at the top. President Theodore Roosevelt signed this for a gentleman named George B. Moncrief in 1904 on the occasion of his becoming a chief bosun in the Navy. 
and there's his signature at the bottom, Theodore wow. Roosevelt. So those are a couple of individual ones, and then the collection I have over on this side is one single officer's sort of complete naval career from start to finish. So it's a remarkable collection. Um, his name was Kenneth McAlpine, and this earliest one that we have here is, um, this, this one happened to be signed by the Acting Secretary of the Navy, whose name I actually can't read, but this early on in this gentleman's career, this was 1877, he was commissioned as a cadet engineer in the United States Navy. So that's the beginning of his career. And so that's 1877. By 1883, we have him becoming an assistant engineer with the relative rank of ensign. And that one is signed by Grover Cleveland. So he was moving along in his career. Um, this one is also Cleveland. Uh, apparently McAlpin had another um, promotion. He became a past assistant engineer of the Navy with a relative rank of lieutenant junior grade. So he was moving along. That's 1,893, so we're about 20 years into his, or a little less than 20 years into his career. By 1,899, he became a lieutenant in the Navy, another promotion. This time his certificate was signed by William Howard Taft. Wow. I know it's really it's really remarkable yes, when like history. it's right here <laughs> and these history. these are original signatures these men were right in front of so these documents they, they, just like we are so, so yeah this this these were not spit out of laser printers right. and you know these are original documents okay. and here he is becoming a lieutenant commander and now we've made it all the way to 1906 and here we have another TR we're meeting Teddy Roosevelt again and finally, in 1909, he became a commander. So this time we have William Howard Taft. Wow. So we've just gone from 1877 to 1909 with Kevin McAlpin in his naval career. So, so four these, administrations, I think, or five? Or? Something like that, wow. yeah. I mean, these documents are significant for, obviously, for multiple reasons. They, they take you right into the heart of the history of the Navy with these officers who were moving through time, being promoted in their careers, and then obviously they're significant for the signatures that are on them and the people that were in the presence of these documents. Do you have any idea, does the Navy still issue, I mean, these are beautiful documents. They're they the are. illustrations on them, the, the calligraphy and all I that. honestly don't know what they look like today. I have a volunteer down at the museum who's whose husband is on a submarine, and she says, my husband's commission certificates don't look like that. <laughs> it could be, you know, I, I don't, so I don't know what they, what they look like now. They're works of art in themselves. They really are. And we saved the oldest one for last, actually. Okay. Um, this one, I, this was another one of those moments where I opened a drawer at the museum and I just had to kind of stop and take a breath, because this one does take us all the way back to the 18th century. This is a 1799 commissioning certificate. And it would be pretty significant in and of itself because it's James Barron's uh, commissioning certificate. He was a pretty significant officer in the Navy back in those days. Came all the way out of the Virginia State Navy before we were even a nation and wound up in the U.S. Navy. But it's signed by John Adams. Wow. And I just had to look twice and three times to make sure I knew exactly That's what amazing. I was looking at. But it's, it's an amazing document and it's amazing collection. What's interesting, I mean, this actually looks like the newest document. <laughs> it's a very good I mean, the, the print is, these are all the design of them. They're trying to look old, they're trying to look beautiful. I think this some looks of them very... are paper, some of them are parchment, but it took all the way till the middle to late 19th century before generally manufactured paper became pulp yeah. paper. Right. That doesn't last very long. So the farther back you go, yeah, the paper's really high quality and wow. it lasts really well. So. Um, you, you know, museums love artifacts that kind of take care of themselves. Yeah. They're, they're not <laughs> prone to a lot of deterioration and they can still make you, you know, be amazed at any given moment. Have these ever been on display, do you know, in the Naval Museum? I know Shipyard this museum? one has. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the rest of them. Um, I really don't know. But I'd love to put them on display oh, yeah. at yes. some point, at some opportune moment and uh, have folks come in and be able to take a look at them. So in the future, yes, I hope to put them on display. Well, good luck with that. would be fantastic. And, well, thank you for coming and sharing these. These sure are fascinating. Thing. And Who knew that 
this was in the drawer upstairs at the Naval Shipyard Museum. We, we, you know, a lot of museums have plenty of things on reserve that for many reasons, there's, you know, it's impossible to show everything, certainly not all at once, but yeah. give us enough time and we'll eventually get some of these things out onto display. But, you know, President's Weekend is coming up and so now we can say we've met all these presidents here Fantastic. today. Fantastic. Well, thank you for introducing us to them. My pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, Diane. You're welcome. That's it for our show today. If you'd like to find out more about any of the exhibits or events that we discussed on this show, simply log on to www.portsvaevents.com. You'll find all the events taking place in Portsmouth listed by date, including the museum events, and most of those listings have links directly to the museum's various websites. I'm Rob Lauer. Join me next time for our March-April 2018 episode of Museum Moments. <laughs>